This is the new Nissan Aria. Now in this video, I'm going to tell you all you need to know about it, talk you through the design, the interior, we're going to take it for a drive, and of course, I'm going to launch it to see how quick it is from 0 to 60 miles an hour, because I'm Matt Watson, and you're watching Car Wow. And if you haven't done so already, please make sure you subscribe to this channel and hit the bell icon to turn your notifications on. That way, you won't miss a single review. Buy, sell, car, wow. Let's start this video by talking about the design of the Aria, and I like it from every single angle. Really nice rear end with that light bar, Nissan badging, the spoiler. Moving to the side, it's got a sloping roof line to make it look coupe-like, even though it's a big SUV. In fact, it's slightly longer, taller, and wider than a Qashqai, but way better looking. I like this one, the fact that it comes in two-tone paint. That is an option, though. So two of these 20-inch alloy wheels. As standard, you get 19s. Here at the front, it looks great from here as well. The grill, which isn't actually a grill because it's an electric car, you don't need a grill to call an engine because there's an engine, there's an electric motor. You get the idea. But anyway, underneath here, it's got a pattern effect. We have to get in close to see it. And I know what you're thinking, look, there's some vents here. They're surely fake, aren't they? Well, no, they're not. I'll just get my stick of truth there. And I'll illustrate here by threading this through. Look, it smooths airflow over the wheels. Ta-da! Now, this thing looks way better, if you ask me, than a Tesla Model Y, a VW ID4, a Skoda Enyaq, and it's even better looking than a Ford Mustang Mach-E. Thing is, the Aria's good looks do not come for cheap. This car starts at £42,000, which is about £15,000 more than the starting price of the Qashqai, though this is slightly bigger posher and of course it's all electric and electric cars are just more expensive now if you're thinking about changing your car you need to click on the pop-out banner up there or follow the link in the description below to go to car wow you can sell your car through car wow and our dealers will bid on your car to make sure you get a great price for it then you can use that money to put towards your new car and to make sure you're paying a fair price for your new car you can check out all the offers on car wow dead easy to do if you want to do it at a later date simply google wow me car wow and we will wow you here on the inside the area is just as freaking lovely as the outside. Nissan's cars are normally a bit mm, interior-wise, but this is on another level. They've really upped their game. Sort of reminds me of the BMW iX, the way you've got this twin-spoke steering wheel. You've got very minimalist design with like touch buttons with a bit of haptic feedback, so they vibrate when you press them, though it's still not the easiest to use, but at least your climate control functions aren't buried in the menu. And just like the iX, you have this big wrap-around infotainment system. Wait, I'll just turn that down. Wait, it doesn't quite respond quick enough. Just shut up, go. Yes. Anyway, however, not the BMW, the definition isn't quite as good. The graphics are a bit fuzzy and it's not so responsive. In fact, I don't think the infotainment system feels quite as slick as that in a Ford Mustang Mach-E. And if you want to see my full in-depth video review of that car, click on the pop-out bar up there for the link in the description below. You've also got a big digital driver's display. There's quite a few different menus you can cycle through. But once again, the graphics aren't the sharpest, but they'll do. In terms of the feel, yeah, materials feel nice. I like this suede effect here and here on the dash. Though I'm a bit concerned by this wobbly stitching there and the way that these bits here with these switches, which are quite neatly integrated for the stereo and the hazard one lights, don't quite line up. However, this car is a pre-production prototype. It's basically what you're going to buy, but they hopefully will sort these things out for the customer cars. The seating position is good. And on this particular car, you've got all the electrical adjustment, not only on the seat, but also with the steering wheel for that premium feel. In terms of practicality, well, under here you have small space, but it does have wireless charging for your mobile phone. You also have some cup holders here, and look, you've got some holders, so it will help keep a bottle in place, and you can remove that. I oh, know you can. Please remove. There we go. <laughs> I didn't just break it. Down here, you have some more storage for the mobile phone if it's not charging. Don't know what that bit's for there, but the pattern is like the pattern there, which matches the pattern on the grill. You've also got a USB normal and a USB-C there, and you've got an old-fashioned 12 volt charging socket as well. In terms of more storage, look, we have a glove box, which is mm, it's an all right size, but it is lined with felt, so it feels expensive. But check this out, right? If I press this button, we have an electrically deployable tray. You could probably put your laptop or something there or your iPad to watch. Not when you're driving, when you're charging the car. Let's put that away. All right, door bins, big fit flask and a bottle and more. Though they're not lined with felt like the glove box, which is a bit annoying. And the plastics down here do feel a little bit on the cheap side. Final bit of storage up here. You've got your useful sunglasses holder. And I do like this. 
Oh, this nice square, very modern looking rear view mirror. And there's something special about that. More on that later. In the back of the area, there's plenty of knee room. There's lots of foot space as well, especially because obviously you've got batteries underneath the floor. There's no like exhaust system having to go through. So there's no lump in the floor. So if you need to carry three people at once, there's plenty of room for everyone's feet. Yeah, it's good. And the seat bases are nice and deep as well. I like that. Because the batteries are underneath the floor, it does raise the floor up slightly. So your knees are slightly higher than they are in an internal combustion engine car. But it's not as bad as in some other electric cars when you feel like your knees are around your ears. Speaking of which, headroom. This is the only slight problem. The sloping roof line does eat into headspace. I'm fine. Taller people will be fine-ish, but really tall people will end up touching their head on the roof. It's probably made a bit worse by this particular car's optional panoramic glass roof, but you do get more headroom in a Hyundai Ionic 5. And if you want to see my full in-depth video review of that car, click on the pop-out banner up there for the link in the description below. So it's a nice place to be here. You get creature comforts in this particular car, such as, oh, heated rear seats. You've got your USB ports there as well. You have some pockets on the seat back, some decent sized door bins. The rear windows are big, but unfortunately, they don't go all the way down. Another unfortunately is this. Look, yes, you do get an armrest here, but the exposed cup holders means you end up putting your wrist in them and there's no through loading. Why is there no through loading? Another thing that's a bit annoying is you've got these zippy covers for the Isofix anchor points. That's not the issue. The issue is that you have to bodge around in there with the Isofix bits to get it attached. It's not as easy to get a, as when you've got flip up covers, but I suppose the flip side to not having flip up covers is you're not going to lose them. There is enough room here though for those big rear facing child seats without having to move the front passenger seat forward at all. Yeah, it's spacious and quite salubrious. Now let's check out the Aria's boot. So the capacity is 466 litres, which isn't really that big for a large SUV. An ID Force boot, which isn't that big for a large SUV, is 543 litres. So this is a bit smaller than that. Hmm. Also, it gets even smaller if you have the four-wheel drive version because then you don't have so much underfloor storage. At least you do have the ability to divide up the boot as you might wish with these special dividers. Now oh, look, now load lift. You've got some storage down here and here and some tie down points there. They are a bit fiddly to pop out. There we go. There are no 12 volt sockets back here though, which is a bit annoying. It's only something else which gets on my nerves a bit. It's this, look. Ah, the release for the ah, rear seats. It's not only hard to get to, you have to lean across the boot like this. But, ah, they're really awkward. Still, you do get a flat load bed like that, which is handy, so you can slide things to the front quite easily. It'd just be nice if you could lower the seats using some handles in the boot. That brings me to five annoying things about this car. You see, unlike some other electric cars like a uh, Kia EV6, a Hyundai Ioniq 5 and a Tesla Model Y, you don't have a front boot. A fruit. No, no, there's just the electrical stuff there, like the motor for driving the front wheels and some other things. Mm -hmm. If you don't like sitting on dead animal skin, even when it's this fine, soft, napper dead animal skin, you can get a vegan interior. No, it's not fully vegan because regardless of what trim you go for, man-made or animal-made, the steering wheel is always leather. Duh. If you want to tow with your Nissan Ariya, you absolutely, positively, completely must, without doubt, get the four-wheel drive version because it has a towing capacity of 1,500 kilos, which is all right for an electric SUV. You can't go for this front-wheel drive version because it can only tow a pathetic 750 kilos. And I think I can tow more than 750 kilos. Not having a proper physical button for the driving mode selector is a little bit of a problem. Yes, I know it looks cool, but you do have to take your eyes down off the road to see where you're pressing to actually operate it. Unless, of course, you can read the indentations in the center console out of the little arrows and then you know where it is. It's a bit like reading Braille, though if you can read Braille, you probably shouldn't be driving the car. With this car, you get two levels of regenerative braking. Now, obviously, you can turn it off. So here's me coasting along in a circle. I'm going to lift off the accelerator. I haven't got the regen effect on, so no nothing's really happening on a lift off. It's still just rolling quite a lot. What I can do is pull this lever back, and then it gives me the regen effect. So now, when I lift off the accelerator, the car's actually slowing because 
the motor is working like a dynamo to put energy into the battery but obviously that takes energy out of the car's forward motion so you slow down what i can do to make it even more intense is press this button here to go into e-pedal mode and now when i lift off the accelerator the car really slows much more significantly but there is a problem in the past the e-pedal mode in a nissan would let you completely drive just using the accelerator because it would even engage the friction brakes to bring you to a complete stop but for some reason they've removed that functionality for this area so it'll always creep along a bit and then like some other electric cars you can't turn off the creep function and who wants to be a complete creep eh thankfully this car has plenty of cool features to help make up for all this here's five the area comes with lots of equipment as standard so you get stuff like auto cruise control and surround view cameras look it's my cameraman's legs there look look at this they're clicking them up these ridges and contours in the seats are actually based on a concept used by NASA to help promote blood flow if you're sitting in one position for a long time. And apparently it'll reduce fatigue in your back and your buttocks. One area that many manufacturers often forget about is making sure that you can store the low cover underneath any false floor. Look, they should order this because otherwise where do you put it in the car when you're loading it all the way up, eh? Not quite satisfied with the location of the centre console. Do not fret, because look, you can move it forward and backwards. One of the problems with giving a lift to tall people is that they can block your view from the rear view mirror. But don't worry, because the Aria gets a special camera which is displayed on the rear view mirror when you pull a little switch. There we go, look, there you can see me, it's, it's all good. And obviously I'm far prettier to look at than that other bloke. Now let's talk about batteries and charging and all that good stuff. So the first thing for you to know is that Nissan has got rid of its horrible Chadamo charging port, which then used in Japan. And now we have like the European style CCS for DC charging. Yeah, that's much better, isn't it? So the option on this car, you can have a 63 kilowatt hour battery pack or an 87 kilowatt hour battery pack. The ranges of the area go from around 220 miles for the lowest range one to 310 miles range for the highest range one. You can get front wheel drive or four wheel drive and power outputs range from 217 horsepower all the way up to 394 horsepower. In terms of charging, well, if you're a fast charger, it can only charge at 130 kilowatts, whereas things like a Tesla Model Y can charge at over 200 kilowatts, if you can find a 200 kilowatt charger, that is. You're mainly going to be charging using the normal like wall socket, seven kilowatts at home. And for the bigger battery version of this, it's probably going to take you about 14 hours to charge it fully. So you're going to have to leave it more than overnight now which is the best version of the area for you to go for well what i'm going to do is go into car wow and i'm going to configure what i think is the best all-round area in terms of the motor the battery and the spec and if you want to see what that is and the saving on it click on the pop-out banner up there or follow the link in the description below now let's see what this nissan area is like to drive starting with in town because that's where electric vehicles are at their best and the first thing i'm noticing about this area is the suspension i wouldn't say it's firm or anything it just feels a little bit busy so the car does like jiggle about a bit when you go over bumps and you also hear quite a bit of noise thumping from the suspension if you hit a more severe bump now we're going to come up to a place here which we're just going to show you the thump of the suspension here's a sharp bump do you hear that noise Ma? One thing I can't complain about though is the steering. It is nice and light. Now the turning circle on this car is 11.6 meters. So it's similar to something like a Ford Mach-E. It's adequate look. I was able to do a full 360 in that space. One thing I can't complain about with this is the visibility forward. It's brilliant. You've got a low dash, you get a great view forward. The door mirrors aren't the biggest for an SUV, but they're big enough. Get a good view out of them. Yes, you get a big blind spot from this pillar here, but that's the same in many cars. The view at the back window isn't great. Thankfully, though, you can spec that camera that I've already mentioned. What's not good, though, is the blind spot. The back pillar is really thick, so when you're like, pulling out of junctions like that, filtering or you know maybe pulling out of a driveway across the road that is annoying now let's see what the area is like to drive on the motorway so i've set the adaptive cruise control to 70 miles an hour i've got the steering assist keeping me neatly in lane and i've got a radar checking if there's vehicles in front of me and it'll automatically slow me down if it needs to so i've reset the trip computer i'm going to cruise along for a bit and we'll see how much energy this thing uses at 70 miles an hour mm. while we're doing that 
it's a good time for me to comment on what it's like to travel in. So the seats are comfy, this motorway is a little bit bumpy, so I am feeling the bumps a little bit, but it's not too bad. As you go quicker, this car suspension does get a little bit better. I am hearing a bit of wind noise from around here. It's always the case with electric cars though, because you don't have the engine drowning out those noises, but it's not intrusive and I don't really hear any road noise at all, which is good. Bear with me for a bit while we put in some more miles to get a reading. Okay, so I've driven for five miles and it's saying that I'm averaging 2.3 miles per kilowatt hour times up by the 63 kilowatt hour battery pack. You're looking at 145 miles cruising at 70 on the motorway. I say 70 because something bizarre is happening. The speedo says 70, the cruise control says 70, but my average is 67 miles an hour. Hmm, bizarre. Any reason why that might be? Let me know in the comments below. Now let's see what the area is like to drive on a twisty road. So I've got it in sports mode. Ooh, exciting. What I'm gonna do though is turn the regen braking off. So go from B into D. So when I lift off now the car coasts like a normal internal combustion engine automatic. That's actually better for when you're going quickly on a twisty road because you don't suddenly upset the car's balance if you lift off the accelerator due to panic or planning, you know, like when you want to roll around a corner at speed. And actually, when you are rolling around a corner at speed, despite this thing's weight, it actually grips and goes around surprisingly well. There's hardly any body lean at all through the corners. You do start to sense the car's weight if you're really going quickly into a corner and it does run out of grip and does start to push wide. But it's actually surprisingly good and quite responsive to your steering inputs. Another thing I'm surprised about, the brakes. Now, sometimes in electric cars, they can feel a bit grabby but these are super natural there is one problem though well actually two the first is that with this front wheel drive car when you put the power down when you're exiting a corner you can feel oh and there's a the second one actually uh, the, the second problem is that when you hit a bump you suddenly get this kind of like thing where the car just completely loses the plot it goes blah, 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 like that the suspension just can't cope it really can't anyway back to what i was saying originally if you've got the front wheel drive version it can struggle to put its power down when you're exiting a turn if you apply the accelerator too suddenly and the stability control when it senses that it needs to kick in it really kills the power for quite a long time it's like no you've been naughty you've lost grip we're going to just rein things in a bit until we think you're capable of being more sensible sort of like that this particular version of the Nissan Ariya is supposed to do 0 to 60 miles an hour in 7.5 seconds, but we're going to find out exactly just how quick it really is by using my specialist timing gear up here. Yeah, I'm going to launch it. 3, 2, 1. Not a quick getaway. Speed is building. And 0 to 60 is 7.88 seconds. What's the quarter mile? What's that going to be? 16.14. Ooh. Now I'm going to see what this car's like for stopping. So I'm going to put everything into maximum regen mode, e-pedal. So as soon as I lift off the accelerator and go for the brake pedal, it's going to be braking already. Let's see how long it takes this thing to stop from 60 miles an hour. Right, let's go up to 60. Okay, here we go. 60 miles an hour, there or thereabouts. Here we go. Three, two, one, brake. It stopped from 60 miles an hour in 33 meters, which is pretty good. And if you want to compare it to some similar cars, pause the video now, because we've got a graphic on the screen. Now, before you start commenting, going, oh, wait a minute, you're going over 60 miles an hour. This device actually just registers once I go from this 60 mile an hour mark, okay? So it's accurate, right? So then, what's my final verdict on the new Nissan Ariya? Should you avoid it? Should you consider it? Should you shortlist it? Or should you just go right ahead and buy it? Well, I think you should shortlist the Ariya. It might not lead the field in terms of ride comfort over bumps, boot space, all range, but there's just something cool about it. It looks great, it's nice to drive, and that interior is super cool. I hope you all enjoyed the video. If you did, please make sure that you subscribe to this channel and hit the bell icon to turn your notifications on. If you want to see how much you can get for the car you're selling and to make sure you're paying a fair price for the car you're buying, make sure you click on that box to get a car wow and of course click on the video windows for some more videos.